I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Guru Talk. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today joining us is our good friend Lane Norton, who will be helping us to kind of go through the different literature and different, uh, I guess you could say, uh, I like to call it almost like pseudoscience that we hear out there about artificial sweeteners. Um, now, artificial sweeteners has been around, I remember, and I don't even remember what year it was, I got a little gumball in the mail when I was a little kid. And it was the first, I think, NutraSweet had ever come out. And they sent everyone a gumball to try with this NutraSweet uh, sweetener, which was aspartame, essentially. And uh, that was my introduction into the world of, uh, of artificial sweetness. Now, my, I know, I remember my mother used to drink Tab when, she was, when we were kids, which yes. contained saccharin. I thought it was the nastiest tasting thing. Why anyone would want to drink this, I have no idea. But people didn't want to use, didn't want to use sugar. Uh, saccharin was the first artificial sweetener, but then they went to kind of uh, NutraSweet, which was aspartame. Now we're, we pretty much deal with uh, um, sucralose and ACE-K. And so, Nate, Lane, I have you on here because I, I can give all the talks I want about you know, how this stuff is not going to bother you. You obviously know the research. You're in the field. Talk to me about artificial sweeteners, your experience with them, and then why do you think there's so much hocus pocus out there about them? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, I appreciate the, the platform. Uh, I think I'll take the last question first, which is why is there so much hocus pocus out there? You know, I think that people get religious about anything. And if you've ever dealt with people who are anti-artificial sweetener, uh, it's almost like a religious cult. Oh, yeah. And even the way they say things, it's, it's almost like you can't have something that is pleasurable that has no downsides because I mean, just look at like how, you know, different religions will demonize sex or you can only, you know, you can only do it missionary and don't you dare look at each other in the <laughs> eyes, you know, like that sort of thing. So it's like, um, there's this kind of guilty feeling that you should, that we've been programmed to have if we're having something that is sweet or pleasurable. And so I think people always kind of associate this with, well, there has to be some kind of trade-off. There has to be some kind of downside. Right. And so I think a lot of the, the things you hear are, you know, it gives you cancer. Right. Um, it, it makes you fat. Yeah. Uh, it, it raises insulin. It messes up your blood glucose. And then more recently, it's, well, it messes up your gut microbiome. Right. right. And the aspartame in particular, uh, all the artificial sweeteners, but aspartame in particular, is one of the most tested compounds in the world, to be quite honest. It's been around, 30, like I said, since they got that gumball for the last, what, 35, 40 years probably it's been around. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Been around a long time, a lot of testing on it. And so I think one of the, let's just take aspartame, for example, uh, because I think this stuff can all sound scary until you understand how chemicals are metabolized and that, you know, one, everything is a chemical. I actually did a post on Instagram about this the other day where people get, you know, really scared of chemicals. And it's like, well, if I broke down like an organic banana into its chemical <laughs> components, I could make it organic. Yeah. I could make an organic banana sound scary, you yeah. know? And so, you know, aspartame is a dipeptide, really interesting story, actually, how it was discovered. There was a guy who was working with dipeptides in a lab and he uh, went to lick his finger to turn a page and noticed that it tasted sweet, and yeah. that's how aspartame was discovered. And when you say so, dipeptide, we're literally talking two amino acids. That I mean, right. it's probably the most natural, you know, artificial sweetener. If you want to say artificial, it's the most natural of anything that you could possibly make because it's just two amino acids together that happen to create this sweet effect. Now, why would anyone think that two amino acids could cause problems, you know, in the body? I, I never understood that whole connection 
it was just right. There is sense. there is a slight modification, like I believe it's chlorinated, and so you do get um, so the three byproducts of the, of its metabolism are one aspartic acid because yeah. that's one of the amino right. acids, phenylalanine because that's the other amino acid, right. and then uh, methanol. So and, mm -hmm. and people go oh, oh well there we go there yeah. you know methanol yes and yeah yes yes methanol is toxic at the right dosage yeah. but again dosage makes the poison and i think that because we most people understand like if you look at a can of coke and you see oh 40 grams of sugar mm -hmm. we we understand that, that like that's a sizable amount of sugar i mean you're yeah. talking about like like three tablespoons of sugar right mm -hmm. well aspartame is 200 times sweeter than sugar mm -hmm. so what you actually need ends up being like 50 milligrams right and you would get more methanol out of a glass of tomato juice than yep. you would out of a, a can of Diet Coke. So, yep. you know, this idea that, oh, well, it's doing these bad things. And it's like, well, well how, right? Because you've got aspartic acid, phenylalanine. And I, I, I have seen one of the other claims is people say, well, they have neurotoxins in them and, and excitotoxins. <laughs> and what they're referring to as aspartic acid and mm -hmm. phenylalanine, right. which yes, if you dump them on brain cells on a Petri dish, yes, they are neurotoxic. But... <laughs> People don't understand that we have this thing, one, called the blood-brain barrier, yeah. and two, a dosage issue. So uh, you, you don't just – things don't just freely cross the blood-brain barrier. If they did, no one would live more than a few seconds because everything would kill you. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, those aren't the only two amino acids that are neurotoxic. I mean, glutamic acid in particular, glutamate, mm -hmm. is very neurotoxic if you put it directly on brain cells, which mm -hmm. is not how physiology works. The other thing I always I tell people, I'm like, well, are you scared of eating a steak? Because a steak has 10 to 20 times more aspartic acid and phenylalanine in right. it than, you know, a can of Diet Coke. Yeah. So we got those two out of the way, kind of covered the methanol. And so more recently, what people have said is, well, it messes up your gut microbiome, right? Because even you're, you're talking about post-digestion after the amino acids have been cleaved. Well, maybe this molecule aspartame itself does something bad before it's been digested. Right. And so uh, there have been studies, actually more so on sucralose has been more the claim, uh -huh. which is uh, sucralose is just a chlorinated glucose molecule, I, I believe. So the claim is, okay, it does, it does the, it, it, it hurts the gut microbiome. And if you look at the research, it's actually very comical that people make these arguments because the original research paper that came out where people went crazy over this mm -hmm. was they actually weren't even assessing uh, sucralose toxicity. They were looking at a, like a, a bioluminescence protocol for imaging with E. coli cells. Mm -hmm. And they showed that if they put a lot of a, a crap load of sucralose on E. coli cells in a Petri dish, that it was toxic to them. Right. And it's like, cool what do you think that actually means for human physiology <laughs> like i mean it's it's wild i mean we had a gut microbiome expert on our podcast her name's uh, dr suzanne devkota mm -hmm. i mean this gal has gone to like was invited to the nobel prize event i mean she publishes in science in nature right and when she sat down in our office I said, you want a drink? She's like, yeah, I'll take a Diet Coke. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa. I was like, you're going to really tick off some people. And she's like, you know, you always have to think about like, like people get so hung up on the little stuff. She said, first off, the evidence that artificial sweeteners are, are bad for you is if you are a Petri dish getting a really high dose <laughs> or a rodent getting a really high dose, right? right? Like if you... If you look at the... Or if you have the, phenylketonuria and you can't digest, metabolize those amino acids. Well, actually, so here's the funny thing, Dave. Yeah. They actually gave asp like a, a aspartame, like in a Diet Coke level to yeah. not people, but I, I uh, it was either rodents or monkeys. I, I, I can't remember exactly, but they gave them like a comparative dose. Right. And actually they were able to tolerate it just fine because again, it's such so a, it's small a small dosage. I, right, exactly. Yeah. I tell people that you can... The reason why they put Splenda, because people always ask me, you know, I always tell them, watch Splenda or, or watch um, equal usage in those packets because they add a, a gram of maltodextrin to it. And, you know, if you eat enough of them, you can get, it, it adds up. It's like sugar you're putting into sure. your body. So I said, 
The reason they put that in there is because the amount of sucralose or the amount of aspartame in that little packet is so little that you would never get it onto your food. So they have to put something with it to, to kind of give it like some substance. Otherwise, you wouldn't even see it. That's how little it is, right? That's exactly correct. It's actually why I use the uh, the liquid Splenda. So I'll yes. buy the liquid Splenda it's from smarter, the store. Yeah. Just so, you know, you're not, like you said, I mean, one, one packet, no big deal. But I mean... Yeah. You know, you could easily rack up 20 packets over the course of the day, Absolutely. and that could be about 15 grams of sugar right there. Right, right. Um, so those are, you know, those are some things when I talk to clients about hidden calories that, yep. that they could be getting. That's one place we start. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you look at the arguments that are constructed around artificial sweeteners in terms of like trying to paint them as this, this, um, you know, evil toxic they vilify substance. Them. They vilify them, essentially. Yes. Yeah. It, it's all the, there's two kinds of studies that are used. The first kind is association studies. So they look at a population and they say, oh, well, look, this population used a greater amount of artificial sweeteners and we see X. I guess. Um, and, and that's called uh, cross sectional data. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the mechanistic, you know, we're going to give a rat a thousand to 10,000 times more than they would ever get in the diet. And we're just going to see what happens, right? Kind of like a, I mean, those kind of experiments are useful as a proof of concept sort of thing. Like, yeah. Hey, is this worth you know, assessing further? But those are the, like, find me a human randomized control trial where they show negative outcomes from artificial sweeteners. Isn't you that what they will... did with the rats with saccharin years ago? They gave them like a million yeah. times the amount and they said, oh, they cause cancer. And they so then they started putting that little warning on, on things, you know. In laboratory rats, saccharin caused cancer. But the dosage was insane that they gave, right? Yeah, and that's, that's always the case, um, at least thus far. I mean, I, I'm not, you know... There could be studies that come out tomorrow that change my mind, but I mean, it, it just, now. you'd think, you'd think we would have found it by now yes. after decades of research, you think something would have popped. Mm -hmm. And so even with like, you know, I, I tell people with the, the gut microbiome stuff, like, would well, you care more about rodent research and Petri cell research than human data? Because we have like, there's been actually three human randomized control trials with artificial sweeteners. I think they were all three of them with sucralose. There might have been one with aspartame, um, where they they gave people, you know, like like the equivalent of like two to four like diet cokes per day, right? And they saw absolutely nothing on the gut microbiome. It, yeah, it, it did not do anything. And so you know, it's funny because the people who worry about this are people who will like you know, eat a lot of saturated fat yes. and, you know, not eat enough fiber and, you know, not exercise. Sure. And it's like, you know, okay, these are the things that actually matter for yeah. your gut microbiome health and you're not doing any of these. Well, that, I see these nutritionists that are overweight telling clients of mine that they shouldn't have a diet soda a couple times a day. And they're like 50 pounds overweight and they, they're recommending that they drink regular uh, sugar drinks. I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, you, you really think you're gonna lose weight? drinking sugar drinks as opposed to a, a, a diet drink do you think that taking a diet and i'm sure you're going to address this next do the people really think that if you could have a couple diet cokes per day in lieu of cheating on your diet that it's going to sabotage your weight loss come on i, I your body but we all competed if i didn't have diet coke or some kind oh. of diet drink i would have cheated a thousand times on my oh, diet you know man Save uh, me. i i I'm not ashamed to say that I would I could go through a 12 pack in a day Easy. when I was yeah. you know Easy. super low body fat yeah. and I'm sure there are people out there that will shame me and say oh I did a contest <laughs> prep and I only drank water well good for good for you um, so I think that that there's a few different I'm gonna make the the devil's advocate argument that I hear okay which is okay you know if you have something sweet you're going to get that cephalic phase insulin response, you know, where you, you taste something sweet. So there's going to be that insulin response and that's going to cause you to store body fat, regardless of calories. It's also going to make you hungry, right? Because your body's expecting something and then it's not getting it, right. you know, and I, I'll tell people like, listen, I had cockamamie ideas like this when I got into grad school, but this is also why we have studies so we can actually test these yeah. because it's not good enough to have a mechanism or an idea. You actually have to test it. So the question is, you know, what do we see in humans when we give them artificial sweeteners? Do they increase their food consumption? And the answer is a resounding no. In fact, 
If anything, it's the opposite. So there are a few randomized control trials, and I, I haven't looked to see if there's a meta-analysis recently, but I, I can think of at least four randomized control trials where they compared diet soda to water. They either had people, they would drink, you know, um, I think it was two to four Diet Cokes a day mm -hmm. or water. And they found that people drinking the diet soda actually lost significantly more weight and <laughs> kept it off. And they had an easier time keeping it off too. And I mean, you know, it's a relatively simple explanation. And that is if people do have a sweet craving or something like that, and they're able to satisfy it with a diet, with some kind of diet drink or some kind of diet food product that's sweetened with artificial sweeteners, right. then it appears that they don't necessarily replace that. And I mean, this is, think about this, people who drink sodas, regular fully sweetened sodas, that's not a satiating thing. It, mm -hmm. It's just liquid that's sweet. Yeah. Like, it's not like somebody drinks a soda and goes, okay, well that was 40 grams of sugar. So now I'm going to make sure that I reduce my <laughs> pasta serving tonight. Like nobody actually does that. Right? right. So if it's just somebody like reorganizing their taste buds to, cause it does taste different. It's not as like now, if I have something that's like a, a regular sweetened beverage, I, I'll be like, I hate it. it. What is that? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I can, it. I can, yeah. I can feel on my teeth. You know, every yeah. once in a while a restaurant will screw up their, uh, their, uh, you know, their fountain drink or something like yeah. that. And I'll, my, me and my wife will maybe be like, you take that back because we know that's not diet. Yeah, you, know? yeah, you can tell. Right. Um, so it, that your, your, your um, taste buds are inducible and you can change like how you perceive things. And so when I first tasted a diet drink, I was like, oh, that's disgusting. Uh, and then over time, you know, it gets better and better. And so I've spoken with people who've lost over 100 pounds and literally the first thing they did to get them started was they switched from regular soda to diet soda. Right. And, you know, that I had, I've had people, uh, I had one person on my last uh, post, I did about this comment and said, you know, I was an alcoholic. And one of the things I really had to do in order to kick the habit, because I had such a habit of just, you know, drinking so much throughout the day, because they were, they were, their uh, drink of choice was beer. Right. So, you know, they could consume up, you know, 18 to 24 beers a day. That wow. is a lot of fluid. And yeah. that's, you know, that's a difficult habit to break. Right. So I switched to diet soda and that was my savior because I was able to have something flavored mm. that kind of got that, you know, tick of, you know, you, you know, instead of beer and they were able to not only kick alcoholism, but lose 80 pounds in the process. Wow. So again, it's like, you'll get the art, you'll get the, the, the typical argument. Well, it's not better than water. Well, it doesn't seem to be worse than water, to be honest. It might be a little bit better for weight loss. Right. So like, okay, maybe it's not better than water. And I think you and I would both agree, hey, drink water. Awesome. Yes, please drink water. You know what, Lane? I've done, but I've done my own little studies on myself where I've actually consumed diet, you know, soda or diet drink and tested my blood sugar previous prior to it and after it. And I don't see any change in my blood sugar. What's a zero? Doesn't go up, doesn't go down, nothing. Which implies to me that there's no insulin release whatsoever. You know. Right. So, and I actually did this in undergrad school. But we, um, for our molecular biology class, they mm -hmm. wanted us to run some kind of experiment. So I got right. a blood glucose monitor. That's great. And I did the same thing. I did, um, you know, um, like 40 grams of dextrose mm -hmm. or two packets of aspartame, which is about what you would get for the same level of sweetness. Right or two packets of sucralose. And it may even like you mentioned, that was before I knew that there was actually some maltodextrin in those packets. Oh, okay. And even with that, I mean, there was no, there was no blood sugar response. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and I think I was measuring every, every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I should have seen something if there was something to that. Now, right. you know, the only way it's possible that they were causing some kind of insulin release, but blood glucose was staying flat, you could argue, well, they're also releasing glucagon at the same time. Okay, well, then that means yeah. that the insulin release means nothing, nothing. because I mean, nothing, glucagon right? opposes it, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, and, and again, we have the human randomized control trials. They, you do not see an insulin release. You do not see, you know, impacts on glycemia. It doesn't mess up your blood glucose, nothing like that. So, again, then the, the final argument kind of becomes, well, we should encourage people to drink water. And what's wrong with telling people to cut out processed drinks? <laughs> well, here's, here's what's wrong. 
there's always unintended consequences to misinformation. And like you said, Dave, you may have somebody who it's like, they, they feel like diet. I had somebody that for my first show, tell me like diet drinks are worse than regular soda. Like somebody <laughs> from my first show told me that as a 19 year old kid. And I oh, believed man. it. And so, uh, I avoided diet drinks. I remember one night I was downstairs, in my parents' basement, room looking basement, looking at a whole fridge full of diet Coke. Oh. And I was just like, Oh, of course, I ended up binging on ice cream instead. Yeah, you know? right, right. Like, the worst thing you could so, have picked, yeah. Right, but there are people out there who will have similar response. Like if they could, if they knew that they could have some kind of diet soda mm -hmm. or kind of some kind of artificially sweetened right. diet product to, to, to hold off that hunger craving or that, uh, that sweet craving, uh, it would be a game changer for them. But a lot of people are so scared of this that they right. don't do that and they stay in... Yeah. in even worse habits. Now, I was talking about this uh, the other day with uh, some guys on Heavy Muscle Radio. A lot of people use Crystal Light, you know, when they're dieting. And, and you know, I, I, I hated Crystal Light because it used to, there's so much acid in it that it would always come up on me and everything like that. But if you read the ingredients on Crystal Light, there is maltodextrin in there. It's not carb free. So you could use too much, especially if you're concentrating it like a lot of people do. You can get a bunch of carbs in those in, in Crystal Light, it's, and especially for the people, you know, those guys who walk around with the jug of water, they pour the, the Crystal Light in there and they drink it like they can drink three gallons of that a day. That's a lot of sugar you're adding. So you got to make sure that your diet drink or whatever your diet drink of choice is, is it doesn't have carbs in it. Just because it says sugar free doesn't mean it's carb free too. Yeah. I mean, some of the energy drinks out there have like trace carbs. Now, I think you know, like Monster's a little bit different because they use erythritol, which really seems like it doesn't get absorbed in the GI. Yeah. So it's probably fine, even though it technically has carbohydrate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are things that have trace amounts of, of carbohydrate in it. And again, you know, I, I always tell people, you know, it's funny. People's like, oh, you count two grams of carbs. That's so stupid. This and that. Or <laughs> you count veggies. That's so stupid. Or you yeah. count this. I'm like, <laughs> Well, yeah, in isolation, that probably seems dumb, but over the course of a day, Absolutely. you could be talking about several hundred calories difference if you're not tracking it. Absolutely. And so, I mean, again, you know. Sugar-free you know, gum, right? Oh, yeah. People chew a pack a day. You yeah, know? and it's two grams of carbs per piece, you know. Right. And I, I, I tell people, I'm like, you know, listen, you don't have to track anything if you don't want to, right? <laughs> but just like these are the people that think they're eating 1,200 calories a day and not losing weight, right? Because they're not they, – like, well, I don't track my veggies and, yeah, you yeah. know, I went out to lunch and I had a salad, and, yeah. you know, like yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, the the artificial sweetener arguments really are, are very ex extraordinarily weak. They're always the same arguments. Yeah. And it's just rooted from this fallacy of – you know, God forbid we have this thing that actually tastes good and probably doesn't have any negative health consequences. Yeah. And the other thing that's funny, Dave, is a lot of the bodybuilders out there who are very anti-artificial sweeteners, and then I see them taking the pre-workouts or the protein powders. I know, powders, and they're all like, for artificial What do you think that's yeah. sweetened with? <laughs> and all the protein powders, same thing. The same thing. Now, let me or, ask you this question. Is, is there any studies that you know of anywhere? I, I think there isn't, but I just want, I'm asking you the, the PhD. Any research studies to prove that there's any link between any artificial sweeteners and cancer? Only in lab rats yeah, <laughs> in yeah. very high doses. Um, I mean, you can – listen, there's correlation data showing you know weak correlations between some of these things and various cancers, but – I mean, there was a study, uh, I I don't want to completely dismiss epidemiology because it is useful for asking further questions, but epidemiology on its own should not be sufficient to make claims about what is good and bad for you. And explain because, what, that, what you're talking about, some, some people may not yeah, know what that means. Yeah, so epidemiology is basically uh, you know, cross-sectional data where you're looking at, you say, we're going to look at this population. We're going to see, okay, what dietary, for example, habits do they have. Let's say we want to examine artificial sweetener usage. And we're going to, we're going to kind of look at, okay, across this population, like a lot of times they'll break it into quartiles. So the highest quartile of artificial sweetener consumers, for example, let's say they have 10, 10 servings a day versus the lowest quartile, which has less than one. Mm -hmm. We're going to compare those and we're going to look at, okay, um, do, do one of those have higher rates of cancer than another? Mm -hmm. uh, pick your cancer. Uh, and, and then they'll, they'll kind of report that. Now, in some of those studies, there has been reports 
of you know higher rates of cancer with artificial sweetener consumption. It's not consistent. Um, some show nothing. Some show something. And we don't know what else they're eating and what else they're they're doing. Well, people and who drink the problem the, is people who also take in a lot of artificial sweeteners tend to be overweight too. A lot of them because they're trying to like lose weight, so they're going to McDonald's and they're having a diet coke with it. When but they're not telling you about all the McDonald's they're eating too. You know. Right, and that's why we need randomized control trials to really kind of elucidate this stuff out. Now, what I will say to people is there's literally a study out there showing that eating anything <laughs> at any time is associated with colon cancer. So if you want to get colon cancer, you need to intermittent fast except never eat. So, you know, I mean, that's, but that's like if you extend that logic out, that's what it says. Yeah. I mean, my, my uh, PhD advisor, Dr. Uh, Don Lehman, used to say, if you torture the data enough, you can get it to show whatever you want it to show. Uh, I'm and glad so, you said that. Yeah. And so, especially with, uh, it's funny, we were sitting down having dinner one night and I, I, I had mentioned the same thing. I said, I, I said, I'm not saying epidemiology is useless. And he said, well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he said that. Because so, it's true. <laughs> Because yeah, you know I mean, what, they come out with these studies every once in a while saying that omega-3, you know, fish oil is, is terrible for you, you know. And I'm like, out of nowhere, meanwhile, there's 6,000 studies to show that it's, it's you know, it's, it's got health benefits. And then there's this one that pops up, and that's the one, of course, the Wall Street Journal will put on the front page, you know. Uh, yeah. I think that's why it's important to, you know, understand, for, for, the, for the listener out there who doesn't have a science degree, the, the kind of the hierarchy of evidence in terms of like, what do we, what do we put the most value on? So at the bottom rung, I mean, if we, let's take out anecdote and all that kind of stuff, yeah. because you know, like that's not really research, but uh, at the bottom you'd have like case studies, you know, those sorts of things. Mm. The next tier up, you would have like your Petri dish or animal studies right above that. You would have like cross-sectional data, like we were talking about just now. Then you would have like cohorts. Now cohort is kind of cross-sectional, but it's a little bit different. That is where you take a population and you examine traits and compare that to, you know, like we were just talking about, except you do it with the same population over time. So you would like, for example, maybe you had a cohort of a hundred thousand people and you wanted to look at a, a, a one I'm thinking of recently is uh, the association of meat with cancer, but also with fruit and vegetable intake. So there was, there, they did a really cool study basically uh, tracking people over 10 years and looking at their incidence of cancer. Mm -hmm. And they found, like many studies do, that meat, was meat intake was associated with cancer. However, they found that when the, they also had high intakes of fruit and vegetables, yeah. the association completely went away. Oh, so, really? yeah, so it, it, it's more, so that's where you can kind of, it kind of suggests that, okay, maybe it's the fact that people who eat high amounts of meat. I mean, these aren't bodybuilders are not healthy or are not healthy eaters. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. They're, they're, they're getting that from burgers and, 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 uh, you know, hot dogs and that sort of thing. Sure. Um, but people who are eating high protein diets who are also getting enough fruits and vegetables or eating an overall healthy diet don't have those same sort of things. So that's, that's it's like how COVID. bodybuilders can eat uh, 12 whole eggs in the morning and they have no cholesterol problems. And then they'll tell you if you have one egg a, a day, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to die of yeah. you know, coronary artery disease, you know, because the people who eat the eggs every morning are the fat people that are 350 pounds who eat a lot of other crap with it and a lot of other sugar with it, which is really what's causing the high cholesterol. So, so I, and I mean, this gets into kind of a larger discussion, but I think one of the things to keep in mind um, is that, Everything is a risk assessment and a trade-off. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't have context of risk, right? Uh, so you may do something that, ha that has very high risk, like for example, smoking. If you look at the effect sizes in studies, very powerful risk factor for you know, cardiovascular disease and cancer. Right. Uh, but then people also hear that, well, you know, uh, meat is a class one carcinogen or, or whatever it is. And they think that, you know, meat must have the same, you know, effect as smoking. No, no, not even <laughs> close, you know? And, and so the other thing to keep in mind is that if you are eliminating something out of your diet or reducing something out of your diet, you're replacing it with something else. Right. And you can find, I mean, you can't really find studies showing that fruits and vegetables are bad for you. I, you could find a few isolated things. 
unless you're a carnivore advocate and you hack together some crazy mechanism, <laughs> of, you know, involving <laughs> oxalates and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for the most part, most foods that you consume, you could find some downsides and some upsides. And what I always say to people is, I think we have this kind of like idealist notion that there is one perfect diet for, you know, everyone in terms of heart disease and cancer and all this. And the rea the sad reality is that, you know, the best diet for colon cancer may not be the best diet for stroke. Right. And the best diet for cardiovascular disease may not be the best diet for, you know, brain tumors, you know, sure. that sort of thing. So uh, we, we don't know, but I mean, hopefully those things will get more elucidated in the, in the coming years. But it's important to keep in mind that everything is kind of a risk assessment. And I think people get really hung up on the small things. And when it comes to like artificial sweeteners, I mean, that is like the smallest oh, yeah. thing there is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that all stemmed from our discussion on cohort studies, which as we go up the, the evidence hierarchy, then you have things like human randomized control trials. Now, those are kind of your gold standard for research. And the reason why is you are eliminating the bias of populations, right? So when we talk about cross-sectional data, the reason it's so problematic is, as you pointed out, you know, people who drink more artificial sweeteners, they may have, uh, they may just tend to be people with other comorbidities, including obesity and all these other things. So what happens if we take people and do what we call randomize them? Now, randomization means that we're going to randomize based on some factor that we pick. And if we were like doing a study on artificial sweeteners and whether or not they cause weight gain, we would randomize people probably based on their body weight. Right. So right. We, would, we would get a group of people in, we randomize one to the artificial sweetener group, another to the placebo group. And then we would make sure that the mean weight of these people the was very similar, yeah. not statistically different. And then we would, you know, have one, one group would do, you know, artificial sweeteners, one group would do water or whatever else placebo we would use. And we would do that for a defined period of time. And then we would look to see if the variables that we were interested in, if they're affected by this intake. Mm. And this does a few things. One, again, because you're randomizing, now you can assume that any difference between the groups is due to your treatment and not just some random effect of the population. Uh, and the other thing, obviously, is if you can um, double blind, which means that not only is the treatment group not aware of what they are getting, although it's harder if you're talking about water versus artificial sweeteners, right. um, but the, the researchers are also not aware of which group is which. Right. So they're, they're just documenting the data. And then above that, you have like systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which those basically are studies of studies where they... They attempt to, okay, what is our, what are we asking about? So let's take, for example, weight gain and artificial sweeteners. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's try to take all these different randomized control trials that have assessed this. Let's see, we'll make some inclusion criteria. For example, it has to be, you know, um, uh, at least 12 weeks in length. They had to use at least two servings of artificial sweeteners a day, gotcha. et cetera, et cetera. And then let's compile all that data and see you know what the overall effect is and so those are kind of our tippy top of our evidence hierarchy mm -hmm. now you can you can do a bad meta-analysis because if you put junk in you'll get junk out but for the most part that's kind of how we do things but i think a lot of people you know hear about evidence way down here mm -hmm. you know petri dishes in fact there was just recently a um a headline i saw which is uh sucralose or artificial sweeteners turn healthy gut bacteria into blood pathogens. I'm sure you saw this. <laughs> and if you read the study, it's really comical. I'm like, nobody actually read this study. <laughs> nobody actually read it. So basically what they show is when you gave a super high dose to these specific um, in, intestinal gut microbiota, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, um, in a Petri dish, uh, you could see that they uh, could basically, there could be some changes that would allow the microbiota to, to possibly penetrate or form, um, oh, what was it called? Basically, they proposed that possibly 
they could penetrate the epithelium of the intestinal wall, which could make you go septic, right? right. Like if your gut bacteria gets into your, your system, mm -hmm. you go septic. Right. So how do we know that that's not true? Because we don't have people going septic every freaking day who are drinking diet. Well, that's sodas. what I said. Where are the, the John Romano? Where are the bodies? Have all these people dying? You know, artificial sweetness is so bad, and they've been around for so many years. How come more people aren't dropping dead of these things? You know, right? Exactly. So. And that's, I mean, again, if you don't want to drink, if you don't want to use artificial sweeteners, by all means, don't use them. But I think a lot of it gets to the naturalism fallacy because you'll have some people also who are like. Well, I'll, I'll use stevia, but I won't use you know, right, right, aspartame right, and all yeah, that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. And again, I'm like, okay, you've never just had chemistry class. Like once you've actually had chemistry class and you just understand that everything is a chemical, you get this naturalism fallacy out of your head, yeah. hopefully if you have a brain in, inside your skull. Right. Because you learn that there are things in nature that are horrible, horrible toxins. Hemlock. Way worse. <laughs> Hemlock. Yeah. Yeah, right. So you also find that there are things that can be man-made that are totally safe for you. Right. So, you know, I think that the conversation is kind of co-opted because people, you know, we've been told eat less processed foods, you know, yeah. try to stick to unprocessed foods. But people don't realize that that advice really should be given just based on the fact that unprocessed foods just have are less calorie dense. They're just mm -hmm. not very calorie dense. And it's, I mean, try to overeat on, you know, lean proteins and fruits and vegetables. Right. Good luck. Let me know how that goes for you, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas if you're eating processed foods, while they may not have in, anything inherently in the processing that may be bad for you, if you're eating, you know, I mean, uh, Kevin Hall did a study where they looked at ultra processed food versus unprocessed food, gave it to two groups of people, and they found the people that were eating ultra processed food only spontaneously increased their calorie intake by 500 per day. I'm sure, yeah. Just, just by what's so, in there, oils and sugars and starches they add to all these foods, yeah. Right, makes, makes it hyper palatable, very tasty. Right. So people, but people get really dogmatic about that advice and they think it's the food processing itself that's somehow right. making this food really bad for you. Right. And the evidence shows that it's, it's really just the energy content, that the energy content is so dense and it's so palatable that people just end up eating a bunch of it. At the end of the day, it's all, I always tell people, it's all about balance. You gotta balance stuff. If you wanna have a couple of Diet Cokes a day, if you wanna have a protein powder that has some artificial sweetener because it tastes better than having and obviously way less caloric than if you're going to have sugar in your, in your, uh, uh, in your protein powders. Do it. Just don't yeah. do anything in excess. When you do it, I remember talking about excess. When I used to, back in, I think this was probably early 90s, late 90s, mid 90s, I, was, I would be so hungry, they would sell these, these big jars of like uh, powdered NutraSweet, which was aspartame. <laughs> And I used to sit there and I would spoon it at a, <laughs> while I'm watching TV because I was so hungry. And, you know, the, the worst thing I ever felt, sometimes I'd get like a little bit of a headache if I did too much. And I don't even know if it was caused by that or the fact that my blood sugar probably was low from, from being hungry between meals. But, I mean, that's about as extreme as it gets. I don't recommend people do that, but, I mean, no one really does that. I mean, you drink a couple of Diet Cokes. How much could you possibly drink of this stuff after a while, right. you know? You, there's not that much aspartame in the Diet Coke that it, even if you drank the whole two-liter bottle that did, you have anything to worry about. And so, at the, I'm glad well, you were able to, you know, at least kind of like foo-foo some of these like theories out there. And the gut bacteria, you're right, is the latest thing that I've heard and yeah. didn't make any sense to me either. But you know what? They're always looking to villainize anything, like you said, that, that, that is pleasure-related uh, in our industry. Yeah. Well, I think it's... Uh... It's, it's very interesting. And uh, I, I will say, Dave, for people who have never done a bodybuilding show, who have ever gotten really shredded, yeah. you don't know hunger. You, like, you don't understand right. how hungry you go. There's a reason I, I tell people I'm not retired from bodybuilding. I'm just on an 11 year break right now. <laughs> because like my last shows, I got the leanest I'd ever been and I just have PTSD from being that yeah. hungry. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's, and it's I, I, I'm not, not ashamed to say that like, I've had the Walden Farms sauce uh. You know, like spooning it out. Uh, then you probably pooped your brains out from that stuff. Yeah. Probably. But, I mean, you're just, you're so hungry that you can't possibly imagine. And, you know, people tell you this, and you've heard it. When you diet people for shows, they start complaining about being hungry. I'm like, don't, you're preaching to the wrong person because no one dieted harder than I did. So, I know what that discomfort and that pain and that, that miserableness feels like. If you can't deal with it, then you're in the wrong sport. That's all there is to it. If 
the artificial sweeteners, you know, like diet drinks and stuff that could take the edge off, great. There's no way you're sabotaging your diet if you're eating a militantly regimented diet, if you have a couple sips here or a couple of Diet Cokes here and there. So, you know, for anyone out there worrying, I think this is, fi is the final say, so to speak, judge, jury, you know, final verdict type of thing. Thank you, Lane, for joining us today and uh, dispelling some of these rumors. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Dave. All right, guys. That's going to take us to the end of another episode of Guru Talk. I'm Dave Palumbo with Lane Norton. We'll see you next time.